see the image that Kate is putting out, make sure that you uh, click on her uh, her little uh, box, whatever you would call it. And in the top right hand column, a corner is a little blue um, oval. And then just uh, right click on that and hit pin. And then that way you will pin her image on the screen so you can see Paris and hear all of uh, my the stuff I'm gonna tell you about at the same time. We're up in Montparnasse today. It is very, uh, it's a sunny, pretty day, but it's uh, getting a little chillier. Or double click, yes. I know, Carrie, you're so good to remind me. I did put it in the comments. I did put it at the top comments. Um, hi, Don and Carol, Angela. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. So we are in Montparnasse. Um, this is an area of Paris, either people know it or they absolutely have never been. Um, but there is a, a lot of history. We are pretty much going to focus on just a couple of streets. Um, and there is so much history on all of these streets um, from the people that used to live there, the artists, um, and of course, all of the, the really great cafes that are here. So um, I hopefully uh, you guys all let me know um, if you guys have been to Montparnasse at all. Um, it is, a, it's, you know, just right past uh, the Jardin de Luxembourg. It's not very far from there. But even for me, the first couple of times I was there, I always thought, gosh, it seems so far away until I actually went. Um, the great thing about Paris is you have all those crazy um, streets that crisscross for uh, some of us that are used to the grid system, um, you know, with very very, you know, square streets. Um, getting used to it in Paris is was a little difficult, but what you once you do, it's great because then you just go and you could crisscross and uh, go through a whole area in no time at all to get to someplace else. So we will go ahead and I think we have almost everybody here. Hopefully you guys all have your uh, Kate's image on the screen we have Kate. Um, Kate is uh, doing all of our videos from now on of the walk. She does a great job and Lauren with her. I don't know if they have a the puppy with them today, but at the end we'll see. <laughs> There's Kate and her wonderful uh, mask and Lauren. Kate makes those, uh, Kate, we'll put a link later. She makes all those masks. She's a really talented artist. So we'll share all those. So everybody could go get one. <laughs> so we will go ahead and get started. So we are at um, um, Rue de l'Ambre, which is in Montparnasse, of course. This is uh, at number 35. Um, I just love the color of this. Uh, just kind of stands out against everything else. This was once called the Hotel des Ecoles. It's now the Hotel de l'Ambre. It was uh, Paul Gauguin actually stayed here in 1891. Um, he uh, he broke away from uh, where he was uh, staying with a bunch of the other artists. This was a period of time where an, um, a lot of the artists were actually moving over to Montparnasse from Montmartre because Montmartre was uh, becoming uh, more expensive. So they ca all came over here to Montparnasse and you're gonna see just how many of them um, came, were living here. I was just telling Kate before we started that it's almost like the, you know, quote unquote, new artists of Paris. You know, um, you had all of the, you know, before with the Manet and Renoir, then you have this whole new generation and a lot of them just settled over here for a bit. Um, writer Andre Breton also um, gave up his medical studies and he ended up moving here with his, uh, with much to his parents' chagrin in 1920. And he was a ended up being a surrealist, and so this was really um, Montparnasse was a real hotbed for the surrealist, um, for Dali and um, all of those guys. So they were all over here. Francis, Francis Bacon, um, who just had a big exhibit in Paris um, a year or two ago, I believe, he also lived here for a short period of time. So uh, a lot of the streets are going to have a lot of people that had lived here at one time. The color just so happy. And then just right next door in 1937, um, uh, Simone de Beauvoir lived right here while she was teaching at the Lycée Molière. Um, she was writing her first novel um, here at the time, but uh, nobody uh, wanted to purchase it. Nobody would publish it. That was in 1937. It wouldn't get published until 1979, which is a really long time.
everybody out and out and about on the streets. Not very many. This is a quieter part of Paris for sure. Um, so you don't have a whole whole lot of uh, people usually up and around here. We are just off of the end of the street, um, just to give you guys a little uh, uh, direction. We are just at the end of the street is Boulevard Montparnasse. So we aren't very, we're very close. Um, if we had turned around um, from where we started, if you just walked over, um, you would be in the cemetery of Montparnasse, which is really great. There's the school that's over there on the left, the Lisée de l'Ambre, which is, has some really great doors. There's a lot of really great doors on this street. Um, coming up on the other, on the left side, you could see that other really great door. Um, that is actually um, the Breton Mission. And it was, uh, it, it still is a place for people from Brittany when they came to Paris back then. It was a, used a lot more then, but it was a place for them to come and get uh, help with where to stay and information um, for their stay in Paris. Some of the some of the places on this uh, street, of course, are a little bit more modern, and then you have some that are definitely uh, older. Um, but you also have all these other great windows. That's always a good sign to tell you that um, artists were living there. This is I love this door because <laughs> it's also red. So here up on the corner, um, what we're walking by right now is the hotel. It's now called the Hotel Lennox. And then it also says uh, Hotel Modigli Modigliani on it, just right past it as well. It's a former Grand Hotel des Ecoles. Um, it was uh, Man Ray had stayed, moved into here, um, and he had stayed here for a while. He, um, Tristan Tazar, who was also uh, the founder of the Dada movement, um, had lived here. And Henry Miller moved here from 1928 to 1930. And he, of course, frequented a bunch of the cafes. He'll come up when we go to one of the cafes. Um, but right next to it at number 13, which is now called the Villa Modigliani, um, is uh, where Man Ray also had his studio. Usually could go right where that blue, uh, awning is um, you could go in and then there's another entrance to go into the courtyard. Um, it's a little bit, uh, the buildings inside are um, a bit on more modern side, but you, uh, when you go back, I'll put all the notes in the Facebook event um, of the addresses and stuff. So when you go back, you go check this out, but it was actually a very, uh, the site of a very uh, sad occurrence. Um, Amadeo Medigliani um, had lived up here on Montparnasse. We're going to go by where he lived on another street. Um, but he uh, he had a very uh, high abuse of alcohol, um, and he died on January twenty fourth, nineteen twenty. Um, at the time, he had um, he was dating a woman, um, Jean Jean, and she um, had already been pregnant with one of his children, and they already had a child, and she was pregnant again. And when he got very sick, um, he got tuberculosis. He got very sick and died on January twenty fourth. Um, she came here to stay with her parents and they were staying in one of these buildings that's inside this courtyard. And uh, she had gone up to uh, uh, the fourth floor where they were set, where her parents were. Um, and she was pregnant at the time. And uh, just, it was the next morning after Modigliani died, she jumped from the roof and uh, sadly um, ended her life. Um, later on, Modigliani, when he was, uh, he was buried, they were not buried together because her father wouldn't allow it. Um, and then later on, her father finally gave in and uh, let them be buried together along with their unborn child. It's a very sad story. Mordigliani uh, was very young when he died. We have a episode on the podcast on La Vie Creative, Paris History of Becca Hemingway in two weeks coming up. And it's going to be um, all about Bert Wheel, who was an amazing, uh, an amazing uh, art dealer. So this little place uh, over here across the street, it's not what it used to be called. It's changed sadly over the time, but it used to be called the, the Dingo. And if, you, uh, if you're up on your uh, Hemingway history and you wanna know more, you could join me later on today, but that build that right there with the red awning 
is now the Auberge de Venise. And it used to be called the Dingo American Bar. And that is where actually um, Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald met in April, 1925. Don Stewart had introduced the two of them. Um, he, uh, even though at that time, uh, F. Scott was making much bigger name for himself. Hemingway hadn't written, uh, hadn't published um, the sun also rises, sorry, sun also rises and yet. And so, but he, F. Scott had already heard about him. And so he wanted to, to meet him. And so uh, uh, he, um, Don Stewart actually introduced them. They met here at, the, it was called the Dingo Bar and it was the American Bar. And the reason why they're called American Bars, um, the first time I went to, uh, one another location we'll see today. I was like, American bar, what? I'm in France. But American bar meant that they serve cocktails. So it was a way for, if you wanted a cocktail, you had to go to a place that actually said it was an American bar. Um, he, uh, it ended up getting the name of the Dingo Bar because the owner who opened it in 1923, Mitro, he was uh, always called the Old Dingo. Um, he had a, a boxer <clears throat> that worked for him behind the bar that was a big favorite of everybody that lived in the uh, in the in the area and he would help break up fights <laughs> those uh, the tiles on that place we just passed it's a it's a little uh, seafood place um, it has some really great um, tiles across it that are really pretty to see De Hemingway also uh, saw Josephine in the in the dingo uh, when she was dancing and later on uh, he said that she told him she wasn't wearing anything under her fur coat which you know you know Josephine that wasn't a that wasn't a very big stretch. So the first uh, first of the big uh, cafes of here um, historical cafes we see is La Dome. Um, I love uh, the way that this looks. I think the outside um, is just so pretty with all of the little arches. And but the Dome uh, Cafe de Dome opened in 1898 um, by Paul uh, Chambron. He was a uh, came to, he had a huge presence in Montparnasse ahead of that, and he wanted to open a cafe. He ended up uh, purchasing this location. It was much smaller when it first opened, and then he, um, over time, made it much, um, much larger. Sadly, all of these places are closed, but, you know, I think there's some hopeful news that ne by next month, they're all going to reopen. Um, it was uh, very inexpensive at the time, so the artists came here. Um, because they could sit and drink and eat all day long and uh, it barely cost them a cent. In 1958, when Paul Chamba died, his funeral was attended by all of the artists and writers in Paris. Um, Henry Miller used to sit here um, at the end of the street, so basically right where we were standing. He would just sit there all day long and uh, every time they bring him more coffee, the saucers would just pile up. And so he would just sit there and wait for people to walk by to see him and offer to pay for it. Um, it was his, uh, his idea of how he you know, was able to afford it. Um, everybody used a lot of these cafes, um, especially Le Dome, as their own post office. And so they even had um, a little, <clears throat> excuse me, had little slots behind the bar. So, you know, this is back before, you know, you would text somebody to tell them you were on your way or, uh, <clears throat> you know, let that you couldn't call them. Um, so people would stop by and they would leave a little note there. I love the store right here. This is a picture I actually used um, that I took. Um, but they would go by there to see if they had any messages. Um, could you just even imagine? I mean, today with text messages, would people just go in there like every five seconds? <laughs> in the heyday, the dome is... Uh, that it's long gone now, unfortunately, you know, the, the twenties, uh, the twenties and the thirties is really where this, uh, area was really, you know, popping and, and everybody was flooding here. Everybody had their own favorite, um, as far as which cafe they went to. It wasn't, uh, you know, you kind of stayed to your favorite. There was different groups. Uh, you know, there was a, the Spanish artists would be in one, um, sometimes the, the ladies of the night that we'll talk about, um, would go always go to another one. And this one up here coming up is La Coupole. 
and it is uh it is really inside it's if you like art deco this is the one for you um i actually have a tiny little teacup a little espresso cup that my grandparents bought my grandpa bought when they were there and it sits on my desk so i look at it every single day and i'll show it to you guys at the end um but this one opened on december 20th 1927 ernest fro and his brother-in-law Rene lafelle who actually had worked at the dome um had decided they wanted to open their own place. And so what's better than going right next to your uh, current uh, job? So this at the time was just a, it was a long before I was at Quarries and part of the catacomb and uh, there was a coal depot here. And so at first they had a, a, a small cafe built and then, but they had to go because it was built over the quarries that were used to build many of the buildings in Paris, they had to dig, dig deep down. So they had to go down and put 32 pillars below it just to make sure that the building could stand up. Uh, because they had to go down so deep, they ended up putting a dance floor downstairs, which is still there, um, which you could go in there and, and check it out. Um, but they had to dig way down. And so, you know, it, it worked to their advantage. And so they put their wine cellar down there and a dance floor. Um, on opening night on December 20th, 1927, all of Paris was there, basically. Um, Josephine Baker, of course, was there. There was 1,200 bottles of champagne um, that were drank. The party went until like four o'clock in the morning and it was, it was, there was no sign of it ending. So they ended up calling the police and having them come in and shut it down just so that everybody could go home. Um, there was also a, another great bartender here, Bob. They called him the Prince of the Bartenders. Um, he, uh, served, uh, he served as the gatekeeper and holder of all of the messages as well. So you could, uh, you could just go run around. You could run around, uh, look at those cute doggies. You could run around uh, Montparnasse and leave notes for your friends to come, to come by and find you. But yes, it's very Art Deco. Um, they used to it used to be larger. They used to have space above it. They ended up uh, uh, the people that bought the bought the restaurant ended up uh, getting rid of that. They even actually at one point had a rooftop um, they used as a rooftop bar. So it wasn't. Uh, it was ended up later that now they don't have any of that. But it has inside. There's 32 pillars inside of the restaurant. At one point, they were painted by many of the artists of Montparnasse, including there was one by Picasso. Uh, <clears throat> the restaurant. Um, I thought they had a really great idea that they would just pay. You know, they'd have these artists come and pay paint these pillars, and then they would pay them in uh, food and beverage. Well, in the end, it ended up that it would have been much cheaper for them to pay them. Um, just outright because they cost them a fortune. Um, a 33rd pillar was added in 1988 um, when the staircase that was going upstairs was taken down. Um, you can still see some of them, the Picasso one and many of the original ones are gone. Um, somebody decided to paint over them at one point, which is heart-wrenching. So this one, um, Let's Select, which has a lot of uh, signs on their windows. <laughs> um, obviously, you know, sadly, all these places, like we said, are, you know, as you know, are closed at the moment. Um, but Let's Select opened in 1924 by a husband and wife um, team, the Gelbert. It was the first Montparnasse bar that was open 24 hours. So it, um, you could come there, um, journalists would come there after they put their story to bed and the paper went to print, they'd come here at three o'clock in the morning and uh, get some food. And um, it was also the place for the ladies of the night when they got done with their, with their, uh, their job, um, they would come there to get, uh, get something warm um, and uh, something to eat. Um, it was also, this was a, uh, along with the um, Roton, this was a big place that the painters loved to go to. Um, after World War II, the American GIs that decided to stay in Paris um, kind of made it their official home as well. So they all have their own little, uh, they all had their own little clientele. Um, James Baldwin, the amazing writer, James Baldwin um, wrote, um, most of the Giovanni's room here, which is an amazing book that you should uh, definitely read. Uh, but he wrote most of that in uh, La Select. And this, this of course, uh, 
the uh, what's the I can't remember the relay de Antico it is uh, I'm not sure de la Antico it if you've been there before they only serve one thing steak frites um, I have not gone there because there's always a very long line but that's all they serve is steak frites um, but I have heard that uh, it's very delicious there's quite a few there's also one down um, right behind, right really close about a block from the uh, Eglise Saint Germain du Pre as well. Oh no, what happened here? Oh, this is, I think, uh, so here we have La Rotonde, um, this here on the left. Um, sadly, this wall is probably up there because there was a small fire there um, last year. Um, so that's probably why we uh, have this uh, sad little wall around it so we can't see it. Um, but with the, this one was the hit and it still is today uh, because it basically, because of its positioning, it gets the sunlight all day long. So of course, you know, when you're in Paris and it's lunchtime and it's a sunny day, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I definitely walk around until I find the one where I could sit there and sit in the sun um, outside on the terrace. So it was a uh, very popular, it was opened in 1911 by Victor Lebion um, and it joined two, he basically basically bought up a few shops and put them together to make this larger cafe. Those windows right above uh, the sign is where uh, the restroom is. Um, so you could, uh, you could, when you go, it's actually a really gorgeous restroom. So definitely go check it out. <laughs> uh, but he loved the artists and the writers and he really wanted them all to come and sit there with him. And he, even though he knew they didn't have any money and every day when his daily bread order would come, he would leave it sitting on the bar and he'd kind of just walk away and he would let the different artists come and snag off some of the baguette or take a couple of the croissants. And, you know, it was kind of his little deal with them. Uh, but he uh, he really enjoyed having them there and really catered to them. Some of the artists actually paid him um, in paintings and canvases. So he, uh, but during uh, World War I, um, he survived it by going through all of the different openings and closings. Uh, but in 1918, he was caught up in a uh, cigarette trafficking ring and had to sell the restaurant. He ended up opening a different one just down the street. Um, but uh, sadly, the new owners added a dance floor upstairs and, a bra and the brasserie and the prices went up a lot at that point too, <laughs> of course. But in the 1920s, of course, it brought a lot of the Americans looking for a cocktail. Um, Hemingway didn't like it. He thought it was uh, too much of the, uh, the Greenwich Village. He called it the Greenwich Village bar. He didn't really want to be around where, you know, where all the other people were. He always kind of wanted to find his own little space. Um, and so he, the Le Raton was not exactly one of his very favorites. But uh, the night of the election in 2017, um, President Macron um, celebrated here. And so it kind of put the place uh, a little bit back on the map. But then, of course, people criticized that he had gone there. <laughs> Can't do anything right. So this, uh, this uh, I wonder if ever does ever anybody recognize this guy here? So here in the middle, um, with this is uh, we're on Boulevard Respi now. Um, this is a statue of Balzac, and it was done by Rodin. And in 1885, Rodin was asked to create a statue of Balzac um, for the Société des gens des lettres. And after uh, four other artists, basically one of them died, three of them decided they didn't want to do it. And so, uh, you know, and Rodin was a pretty big deal at this point. And so, but he, he said that he finally would do it. Um, but he, you know, wanted to have complete uh, control over what it was going to look like. Balzac had died in 1850, and for years they talked about doing this monument um, for the great writer, uh, but they couldn't ever get, you know, it took a long time to get it taken care of. Um, Rodin was uh, very opinionated, but he he went through a process with this that he wanted to read. He read everything he could about Balzac. He would visit the homes that he had lived in. He basically like completely threw himself into the life of Balzac before he created this. And he did over 50 different um, sketches and small um, small studies of the sculptor. Of this of the sculpture and but it was very different from what you see today so he went uh, he ended up um, at one point showing them 
And the statue itself, the original statue was Alzac was naked. He did not have this cloak on. He, you could kind of tell that he has, has this big belly that's kind of sticking out. And he was kind of caught mid gait, his, his um, like he was walking when this big stomach is sticking out. Uh, Rodin made his neck a little bit thicker because he thought that was kind of the thing for the modern, the modern, uh, you know, sculptures of the time. And so when he first showed it to them, um, they just were like, no, no way. And uh, Emil Zola had to jump in and uh, help out and get him an extension because uh, Rodin would get upset and say, forget it, I'm not going to do this. And Zola would have to, uh, you know, calm him down and and so finally he did this sculpture and he did the final plaster edition and uh, of him naked and they were not pleased with that at all. So uh, Balz uh, Rodin was actually given a cloak that actually belonged to Balzac. And he was so ticked off um, when they came to a studio to see it. And it was all in plaster at the time that he took the cloak and he dipped it into the plaster. And as it was hanging there wet, he just put it over and covered up his body. And that is basically what we see today. So he presented it at the salon and everybody, uh, of course, still freaked out about it. You know, he couldn't really do whole, do much about it. So they really freaked out about it because now they thought he just looked like a big lump with a head that he looked like a um, they called him actually the snowman for a while because it just I mean, it, it does. I mean, the cloak kind of doesn't really give him any much of a shape other than just this blob. And, uh, you know, you don't really see his arms, everything is underneath. And so um, they decided they, he was so mad that they, they, and they said that they didn't really want it. So he gave them all their money back and he kept the statue with him until uh, he died, Rodin did. And you could actually see at the Musée Rodin, you could actually see a bunch of the studies that he did. You could also see the uh, naked version of him. I'm gonna put, um, I'm gonna, I have something written up to put on my Instagram today, the Claudine Blue Blanc Rouge about that. And I'll put the pictures of the uh, other version of it, but it stayed with him. And on July 2nd, 1939, the statue was cast in bronze and actually placed here um, and uh, inaugurated. There's, it, there is one also in his garden at the Musée Rodin too. Those artists, they don't want to be told what to do. I don't blame them. <laughs> so this little, this is in one, this little cafe here. It's not one of the, the big Montparnasse ones, but I did want to point it out. Um, Le Charivare, Char 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 <laughs> it's early. Um, just to let you know, if you like um, steak tartare, boeuf tartare, um, this is one of the best places in Paris to get it. Um, it is absolutely fantastic. They will, uh, you could ask for it diced or you could ask for it, you know, you could ask, you, you have all different ways that you could ask them to make it. Um, it comes with potatoes and a salad and it's absolutely fantastic. And it's a great place to sit, especially if the other cafes are kind of overrun with a lot of tourists sitting outside. This was another one that also gets um, a great amount of sun and the people that work there are really, really nice. Um, John Baxter's uh, daughter actually uh, said that this is, she thinks it's the number five of the best uh, steak tartare in Paris, but it's definitely one of the uh, best ones. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And I'll put that in the little notes. But one day I sat there and then watched them, uh, you know, moving somebody into the building. And in Paris, how they do that is they have those uh, trucks that come and then they have the lifts and then they basically move the furniture up and in through uh, the windows. So that was always, that was kind of fun to watch. I think, yeah, I think that a lot of the tourists hit those, uh, you know, early in the morning, it's interesting when you go, I'm an early riser. Um, and so when I go to some of these places at, you know, 8.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, which is very early for Paris, um, usually it's, a, it's mostly just people in the neighborhood. Um, but a lot of these, like these ones here in Montparnasse, you're going to get a lot of tourists up there checking them out. So coming up here on the corner, right where uh, Kate is right now, this is uh, the Rue de la Grande Chamier. 
it was a it was named um, for a ball that actually had been there. It was just over on Montpon, just at 120 Boulevard Montparnasse. Um, in 1788, it opened up. It uh, it just it, they set it up so they built it just outside the city wall, so they didn't have to pay any of the taxes for wine or anything like that. That was pretty smart of them. Um, but it was it was opened by an Englishman named Tixon. And he um, was, uh, he, it was like the place to be of all the places in Paris. This was like the, you know, the ball and the dance floor and everything. Um, he had stiff competition down the street um, by the Closerie de Lila. And uh, he ended up um, having it until it was open until the mid uh, 1800s. But this little spot right where we are standing um, was called the at one point was the model market and it was right here on this corner and on each Monday. Um, many of the more than 670 different registered um, mo artist models would come here at first they were open in Montparnasse but once the artists started moving or I'm sorry Montmartre once they all started moving over here to Montparnasse all the models ended up coming too. so they would just stand around here on the street on a Monday morning um, and in uh, they would just wait for the artist to come pick them up and you know hire them the job uh, you know was a, it was a very specific job people uh, really looked down on it at that time you know if you were an artist model or even a ballet dancer you know you were basically a rung above a prostitute so you weren't looked at very highly but these women actually were very skilled they'd have to hold a pose for hours at a time I just recently watched the Camille Claudel movie and uh, the models that Rodin would bend and, and move to get into these positions. I, I don't know how they held it for three seconds, much less three or four hours. Uh, but the models would come here. They would actually get paid five francs a week or a, uh, for three hours. And at that time, that's what some people in Paris were making in a whole week. So it was you know very lucrative because they were very specifically trained. By 1900, they ended up uh, disbanding the model market there because uh, the neighbors were getting really tired of these hundreds of uh, women. Uh, many of them were Italian um, that would come to Paris and uh, stand there. And then because um, on the street too, we have a couple different schools that actually were here. One of the schools um, that was here is the um, this one right here, the Academy de la Grande um, Chambre, and it was opened in 1904 by Martha Stetler. She was a Swiss painter, and uh, she had come over to Paris originally to work with Charles Garnier when he did the opera. And this actually school is actually still open. Um, it had Gia Cometti actually went here, Miro, Calder, um, quite a big, quite a few pretty big artists at one point crossed through these doors. Um, it was later purchased by Champontier and in, uh, family in 1957, but it's still open. So you can actually see a little sculpture there. It looks kind of like a, my, a little bit like a dying slave of Michelangelo, Michelangelo for a second. <laughs> Uh -oh. um, but it's pretty cool that's actually still there right next door to it um, at number 10 um, was also another school. It was uh, the Calarossi Academy. It was originally located in 1815 um, down on the Ile de la Cité on the, uh, on the corner of the Boulevard du Palais. In 1870, it moved up here to Montparnasse to this location. Um, it was a huge relief because many of the uh, women artists, it was really difficult for women artists to find schools or even uh, teachers. So they, this school actually accepted them. Um, so they had, they had a place that they would, could go. Some of the lessons were completely free. So that actually um, was a huge help to them as well. And at the time, um, this is where, uh, Modigliani, he lived actually at this building we see right here at number eight, um, but Modigliani, um, a girlfriend at, at the time actually went to school there too. So Jean Habuter, she, uh, she went there uh, from 1917 and uh, then she ended up, uh, it's most, most likely 
we most likely assume that this is where she met Modigliani and then Modigliani um, lived at this address till the end of his life. Paul Gauguin also lived there from 1893 to 1894, um, but Modigliani and Jean from 1917 until his death on, in 1920, um, he lived in that location. This really cool building right here um, is very different with these really fantastic windows. This is always a good hint to tell you that this was an uh, artist because they have these, these very big windows. Um, so a lot of the times you're gonna know that it's an atelier. Um, on this building here is a brick building on November 19th, 1916, an exhibit called the Lire et Palette um, was held. It uh, featured uh, the paintings of Modigliani, Kisling, Ortiz de Zerat, um, and also a painting um, from Matisse and also Picasso. And so they held this, uh, this party there, an exhibition. Eric Sete was there, he played all the music. Um, there, was a, there was a journalist that was there at the time. It was a huge success. It had tons of people coming in and out. The journalist wrote that Modigliani um, was better than Picasso. Um, and he began to support Modigliani, giving him a lot of money and uh, supplies, um, but uh, it's all, you know, it, they didn't, he didn't, Modigli didn't, didn't have to go very far. He just had to go right next door. Modigliani, uh, is such a sad story. He died very young. Um, if the podcast um, on the 22nd, when it comes out about Bert Wheel, she did uh, his first and only just solo exhibition um, and he died, he died the day of the ex exhibition just right after it was opening. So it's a very sad, tragic story. Modigliani, his paintings are, are with their very kind of long face and their longer nose. It's uh, definitely, you could spot a Modigliani painting from far away. <laughs> it's easy to see. The, but also back in that brick building um, was a studio of Eugene Oudinot, who was a glass painter and he painted, uh, he painted many of the uh, stained glass paintings in Saint-Germain-Axoir, which has some amazing stained glasses in their side chapels. He also had worked at one point with um, Villers-le-Duc, who was, of course, from no the Notre Dame fame. He did work on the Chateau de Vincennes. And in 1877, um, he came to the US and did a bunch of glass for the Vanderbilt Museum. But today you could also see some of his windows. If you're in New York, you could go to the Met and see some of his, some of his uh, windows as well. Some of the windows, some of the stained glass uh, windows in the churches of Paris, sometimes it's hard to decide which is it, which you love more, just the church itself and all of its amazing architecture or the stained glass windows, because some of them are just absolutely stunning. And Saint-Germain-Luxor has some very good ones. Eugène, Eugène, Eugene. I, I like to call your husband Eugene, but Eugène. And so now we are on Rue Notre Dame des Champs. And uh, this is another little, uh, it's kind of a quiet street. It's a, a street that has a good mix of uh, older buildings and it has some more modern buildings on it. Um, you know, modern buildings in, in Paris aren't exactly what we think of modern buildings here in the US, but um, you have these, uh, oh, I see some blossoms. Such a hopeful sight. So in Rue Notre Dame de Champ, we are just gonna go, uh, we're gonna go down here a tiny bit, then we're gonna turn around and go back the other direction. Um, but uh, that building right there um, was actually belonged um, to William Bogarar, who was um, a amazing painter. He did some ama absolutely stunning paintings in the or say there is uh, the painting that he did of uh, Dante and Virgil um, standing in the background and the two men, the one is like, uh, looks like he's biting the other one's neck. It's a very uh, striking, amazing uh, painting. He also did one about the birth, birth of Venus, uh, but he, at the end of the street, during the week, you could, you, this gate is open. Um, he, this, the building just to your right is he built this huge mansion um, when he was living in Paris. 
And on the other side of it has these great windows, um, great big, huge windows facing north and that he used as his atelier. But he had it built in 1867 by Jean-Louis Pascal and it's classic, classical style. Um, but it's really, uh, you know, I just always wonder who lives in these buildings now. But just right past that too was at number 73 was um, a, in 1908, the art dealer Willem Eild um, was a German collector. Um, yeah, it's just the, this one right here, the next one, 73. Um, he was a German uh, art collector and he ended up coming to France and he moved there in 1904. And right in 1904, he ended up purchasing his first Picassos and Georges Brox. This is when uh, Picasso, you know, he Picasso came to Paris in 1900. 1904, he was starting into his kind of cubist uh, period. And so he bought a few of those. Um, he uh, became a big fan of the naive painters and one of my, another one of my favorites, Henry Rousseau. Um, he was a big supporter of Henry Rousseau, um, which Picasso was as well. Um, that's uh, Don, I know Don and Carol know them because we saw those paintings at that museum. Um, but I love Henry uh, Rousseau. And he was a huge supporter when he, uh, in World War, when the war broke out, he, the state, France came because he was German, came and took ever, took all of his paintings. They ended up taking all of his paintings and ended up selling them at an auction. So not so good. The Germans weren't the only ones that looted the art. So the French did it as well. Um, but uh, he, he also uh, was a big supporter of, of Raoul Dufy, who is another one that I absolutely love. If you've gone into the Musée de Modern Art that's near the Trocadero, um, there's a huge painting that he has done in there. I still want to post about it. I need to write about that painting, but it's so big. I'm not sure how to even post a picture of it um, because it's kind of oval shape and kind of goes almost all the way around a room. See, so you have some amazing doors on this street. This is uh, where uh, a Ukrainian author, Mary Sperber, Sper 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 <laughs> I, don't, I don't know Ukrainian, um, lived there. It was forced to flee um, to the French free zone in World War II, um, but he would make it back up to Paris and he lived the end of his life there in that building. We're going to come up, there's a building we're coming up to that I think is one of the greatest doors in Paris. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, also on this, uh, just right past this on the street, um, James Whistler always also lived here. Quite a few people that lived here. Um, Rosa Bonor, who's our podcast guest tomorrow, lived here, had a studio here for a very short period of time. Um, uh, Ezra Pound, of course, friend of Hemingway's lived here. Um, but uh, James Whistler actually also lived here and John Singer Sargent. So it was quite the, because it was so close to all of those different art schools, there were so many art schools up there just down the street. Um, it was a easy place for the artists to live and have their uh, ateliers. But this door here, I think the, the door up above this is one of the coolest doors in all of Paris. <laughs> I, and that's hard to say. There's quite a few doors, but I absolutely love this door. I think it's gorgeous. I love the ironwork and the caryatides at the top holding it up. It was built in 1904, so it's practically brand new. It was built in 1904 um, by the architect uh, Constant Lemarais, um, and the sculpture was were done by Louis Holwich. Um, I've done I've tried to find out who has maybe lived in this building or who it was, but I've never been able to find anything. Um, but I think, uh, I remember the first time I walked down the street, it literally stopped me in my tracks. It's just uh, so cool. And it's just uh, positioned so perfectly on the street. So it really commands your attention when you get to see it. Yeah, Jamie, yeah, you could go get that street just down the street. You could go get, you could get a manicure when you're there, when you're, uh, in the building where Willem used to have his art dealership.
there's more people on the street than I've ever seen walking down the street. Usually it's uh, very, very quiet. Oh, we have some more cherry blossoms. We're hoping, uh, I'm hoping uh, we're gonna take you to the Jardin de Plants one of these days because uh, their cherry blossoms are absolutely amazing. So I was kind of waiting till hopefully everything was in bloom. This building up here to the right with the huge, uh, with this great courtyard um, is uh, part of uh, the nunnery, the church in Paris. Yeah, everybody has white sneakers on. Years ago, you would never, you would never want to wear white sneakers in Paris, but now everywhere, everybody wears Stan Smith. So you go to any terrace and sit there and look around and almost every single girl you see is wearing Stan Smiths. So we're coming up here. Um, we're going to have a couple of little locations. Sadly, the buildings do not remain anymore, um, but we uh, will show you uh, basically um, where they were um, at number 11 or 111 coming up here just past the school um, was uh, the one time um, apartment of Camille Claudel, who um, as you know, was an amazing artist and uh, the lover and muse of Rodin for a few years. If you haven't seen that movie, Camille Claudel with uh, Georges Depardieu plays Rodin. Um, it's, uh, if you already know the story of Camille Claudel, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. We did an episode about her. I'll list it in, I'll put the link in um, the Facebook event. Um, her story is absolutely heart-wrenching. Um, but the movie is really good and it will leave you, uh, it does really kind of hit you. Um, so right over here, um, we have uh, 111 is where Camille Claudel had her, uh, had a, her apartment. And uh, so it would have been right about where this was, this building was standing. Jan, I could send you all the information, um, but the, uh, the in next door, at 113 is uh, at one point that used to stand a sawmill here. Um, and when it, was a, when it was a sawmill at the time, on February 8th, 1924, um, Ernest and Hadley Hemingway had come back to Paris with their new baby boy, Jack, or Bumby as they called him. Um, and they returned to Paris and they found this apartment that was a little bit bigger than their Cardinal Lemoine apartment, um, but it was over a sawmill. So they traded the, uh, the all night uh, sounds from the Bal Musette below to the all day sounds of the sawmill. And so they came here. This was very close because he was uh, good friends with Ezra Pound. And of course, Gertrude Stein is not for, too far from here. She's just a few streets away. And also it's very close to the Jardin de Luxembourg, but they had this uh, apartment here. This was also where Pauline came into the picture and she would spend, uh, come over there, come over here and figure out anything she could do to, to get her way into their house. Um, and this was also, you know, where uh, their, his marriage with Hadley ended. And for more on that, you'll have to watch, you could watch my other live Zoom I'm gonna to do today, um, all about Hemingway's years in Paris. And then right past that, um, just right past that at 117 is where Camille Claudel actually had rented a studio um, with a couple other English girls. She had gone to one of the schools up in Montparnasse and she uh, rented a studio over here. This is where she was actually studying under Alfred um, Boucher. And then he decided he was going off to Rome. And so that is when Rodin came into the picture and uh, she met Rodin. And, but she had this little studio that her father paid for, helped him paid for. Her father was a huge supporter. Once her father died, literally the day he died is uh, when he, her mean, horrible brother, Paul and, his, and her mother, sent her to the um, asylum and uh, she spent the next 30 years there. In the Camille Claudel movie, they, made, they don't make Paul look so bad, but <laughs> what he did, I think is just absolutely horrific because even doctors were saying that she was fine and she didn't need to be there. So it's very sad. So we're coming up to the end. Look at those great iron balconies. 
wide carriage doors. This is a much quieter place to live. Um, I have actually quite a few friends that live in Montparnasse and it's a little, uh, it's a little cheaper than um, down in Saint-Germain, not much, but a little. So you uh, were very close. We're basically at the end of the lower Luxembourg when we come out here at the, and we'll show you, um, we'll show you the part of the garden. Um, but uh, you're very close to Luxembourg and Saint-Germain. So you have a more modern building here on the right. But we're going to come up to at the end of this little block. I could already see it coming. We are at the uh, the fantastic uh, restaurant, the Closerie des Lilas. In, uh, in the 17th century, um, this was actually the site of an inn that uh, served travelers that would stop for the night on their way to Fontainebleau. And so it was, it's always been uh, quite the little meeting spot for people. In 1847, um, Francois Boulier opened uh, the Boulier um, Dance Hall just across the street. And this was a huge competition to our, our uh, the one that we talked about earlier. Um, and so he wanted, people were thirsty and he wanted to figure out a way to help, you know, get them some food and some beverages. And so he ended up opening up this cafe just right across the street, the Closerie des Lilas. Um, and he named it that, the Lila, because there was a lilac trees that completely covered it. Oh, look at those pretty, what's that? Camomile, ca uh, what are those? Camellias, are those camellias? Um, but he opened up this uh, this restaurant here, and now it is it's a very fancy. It's very expensive. Um, but in 1860, the artists arrived. There's Monet used to come here, Sicily, Renoir, Pissarro, all of those guys would come sit here. In 1910, um, then it was Modigliani and Picasso and Oscar Wilde and um, Simon de Beauvoir. They all would come here and sit. But of course, uh, one of its most famous is in 19. 24, um, this is where F. Scott gave Hemingway a copy of The Great Gatsby. Um, but later Hemingway would come here because it was, as you could tell, so close to where he was living. He'd come sit up here, come sit outside and, uh, is there somebody else filming? Uh, he'd come sit outside and write and have his notebook. And so he would work on uh, many of his books while he was sitting here. Again, it was uh, it's much, much fancier than it is uh, was back then. Inside the bar, they have a plaque that says E. Hemingway sitting on the on the bar and uh, he but he never sat at the he didn't sit at the bar. He always liked to sit at a table or he liked to sit outside. Um, but, uh, you know, Paris is like uh, the U.S. with George Washington on the East Coast. They, everyone wants to say that Hemingway slept there, ate there, did something. Um, but inside they have some pictures of him. Uh, inside it's really pretty. It's a really, I went and stopped in there one day just to have Apero after walking around this whole area. I had a glass of champagne. Um, it's very fancy. The food is, is incredible. Um, it definitely, of course, any of those places that Hemingway had back then are now much more expensive today. This is where he also wrote his uh, Big Two-Hearted River book he wrote there. And then we have the statue here. Um, this is Marsha, Marsh, the Marshal Nye. He uh, ended up, he was a Marshal for Napoleon. He was one of his really loyal soldiers. Um, but then uh, once Napoleon left and he came back for his hundred days, he, uh, Marshall was, he was very, uh, still very close to him. And then later on, Louis the 18th um, wanted to list all the soldiers that committed treason and basically had sided with Napoleon. And uh, Marshall's name was on the list. But um, uh, Joseph Fouché, was trying to hide, trying to hide him, and so he ended up giving him two different passports and told him that he should leave, uh, but he didn't want to leave. He wanted to stay, uh, stay with uh, a lady, and so he stayed. He ended up getting um, arrested. He went on trial. He was on trial for a few months, and then they ended up killing him by a firing line right here in this spot. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, you uh, it's sometimes when you realize some of these things, it's, you know, it's a good to bark the spot, I guess. Um, but, you know, he was, you know, looked at as a, a traitor for a period of time. But then later on, because he had done um, so much for France and all of these battles, they decided to put up this monument, the whole entire base that he stands on is marked with um, just tons and tons of dates of things, of especially battles that he was involved with, but also other dates in his life. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty cool looking statue. Hemingway wrote about it in um, The Sun Also Rises, he mentions it. And he's sitting there looking out at the uh, statue. Soon we'll have some leaves on those trees. And then we're gonna head over to uh, to this other, if uh, have has everybody watched that TV show Lupin on a, uh, um, on Netflix? Yes, Carrie, I did see the Juliet Binoche. Oh my God, that was just that takes off. That movie starts basically where the other one ended. Um, it is absolutely heartbreaking um, watching that movie. She was amazing. Juliet Binoche was in it, was amazing in it, but that movie stayed with me for quite a few days. <laughs> Um, that statue we're looking at right there is the Memorial of Francois Garnier. He was a French naval officer, and in 1860, he went to China. Um, he was an uh, explorer, and he went there with a bunch of other scientists. He ended up coming back to France, and then in um, 19, or 1873, he went back um, with his wife, and he went to Hano Hanoi, and he ended up being attacked by the Black uh, Flags um, the Chinese black flag movement and he was killed and it was I'll leave out the gory details because you might be having your breakfast, um, but it was pretty horrific, but they ended up uh, he was buried there and then the cemetery was actually destroyed in the 1980s and in 1987 his um, ashes were returned to France and they ended up putting it into this monument that had already actually been there for quite some time. So he uh, were right down the street from the observatory which uh, Louis the 14th had built so that you could kind of, uh, there's a dome um, just right down at the end of the street. It's also, if you're looking for those Arago markers, uh-oh, if you're looking for those Arago markers, this is where they start and they kind of go through the city that you uh, made famous in Da Vinci Code. Yes, Camille Claudel, Camille Claudel, 1915. It's just such a, such, oh my God, that movie. I think I had to stop it and uh, take it up a different day because it just was so much. But now we're getting close. This is a, a lot of people call this uh, the lower Luxembourg. It's kind of where it's this little, this, if you look at the map of the Luxembourg artist, it's a little straight uh, park that comes off the end of it. It's actually uh, the gardens of uh, the explorers, Marco Polo. Uh, but you have this great statue in the middle and that TV show Lupin, um, which is so, it's such a great one. I can't wait for the next part to come out. He, uh, this, this uh, fountain features in it. Um, the fountain itself was created by Jean-Baptiste Carpeau, who also uh, did quite a few uh, different sculptures around Paris, but he did the one on the side of the Opera Garnier of the dance and uh, caused a lot of, pan a lot of, uh, people freaking out because it, it depicted these very freewheeling uh, naked people, God forbid. Um, and then he did this statue. He was asked to create a statue uh, or fountain for this. And he did the same thing again. So he put uh, these kind of dancing. Um, there's four different women holding up a globe. It's the fountain of the four parts of the world. Um, it features Asia. Um, she has a long pigtail. Europe, um, basically, she's kind of almost hovering over the ground. Um, Africa has a chain um, around her ankle, and America is standing next to her with her foot on the chain. Um, sadly, that's not the only image. That's not the only time you're going to see that image in statues in uh, in uh, Paris of depicting America and Africa. It's pretty. Uh, it's pretty uh, heartbreaking. Um, but the statue itself, the middle of it. You might recognize this if you've been in the Musée d'Orsay as well, because there is the original model of it in the um, Musée d'Orsay, kind of straight down the middle when you walk in. 
in 1874. Um, it was installed right here, but it was uh, shortly before he died. So some other sculptures had to pick it up and uh, finish it for him. The, uh, the globe itself was done by Eugène Legrand and around uh, the center of the globe, um, it actually has the different signs of the zodiac. And then my favorite part, I wish the water was on, um, but I'm actually surprised there's water in there. But uh, the horses and the dolphins and the turtles that spit water were all done um, by Emmanuel Fremet, who is the same one that did Jean d'Arc, um, right by the Louvre, the golden Joan of Arc. Um, oh, look at how gorgeous that is. I'm sure Carrie's taking some good pictures. Um, but uh, my favorite thing about this is the turtles are spitting water back and the looks, uh, look at the horses and look at their faces. Usually they're getting just pelted with water and the look on the horse's face are like, stop. And they've been standing here, you know, for well over 150 years. Um, but it's, uh, it's pretty fantastic to see. I've got... Um, I think I just posted on my Instagram um, in my Instagram a couple of weeks ago about this fountain. So you could see some pictures of the, the horses getting pelted, but you could kind of see by the looks on their face, they look like they're, uh, they're really tired of it. And, uh, but it's a really gorgeous fountain, especially when the water is going on a sunny day, like today. The, this little park, all the, going all the way down to the Luxembourg, you could kind of see a, a column down there. You could see the palace if you look between the trees right there. Um, this is, it's all, a, it's the Garden of the Grand Explorers, Marco Polo and um, De La Salle. And then we're just gonna, well, we thought we'd walk you down here a little bit. Um, this is one of the very few places you could uh, actually walk on the grass. <laughs> at uh, the Luxembourg. Yes, Val de Grasse is very close. It's just off to the right. Um, we'll have to go through there someday. It's sadly, it's hardly ever open to go see it unless you go for, um, oh, of course we have a fence, um, unless you go for Patrimoine days, but inside it's gorgeous. Um, there's statues that run all the way down the middle of this. They are dedicated to the different times of the day. Um, you have one that's dawn. Um, one that's the day, one that's twilight, and one that's night. But usually you could walk on this. Usually during the day, you'll find kids here in the afternoon um, playing and their parents um, sitting here um, because once you go down a little farther into the Luxembourg, you are, cannot sit on the grass. <laughs> The buildings um, that are over there on the right that you could see are also some of the most awesome buildings. There's one on the very end that I'm just obsessed with. It has rounded corners. It looks over uh, kind of at the top of where the Jardin de Luxembourg starts. This is also a, a, a big place for just to the right where they have a lot of demonstrations. And so they'll walk down through there um, so sometimes you get caught up on that, but usually you just go a block and you're just fine. But these are, yeah, these are all, all these statues were done by different people, um, four different sculptures. This is, uh, that was the day. And we are good. We will take you down to uh, the Jardin de Luxembourg another time. I was waiting for the Medici fountain to uh, be uh, done. And a, a friend of mine in Paris, um, she was walking through there today and I sent her a message and she sent me a bunch of pictures. So I'll actually put them in the, my story. Um, but the scaffolding has come off the back of the Medici fountain. It, it is very clean. It is very, very clean. <laughs> it's almost too clean. It's, uh, it's uh, I don't think they redid the plaster or did redid the, the um, stone, but it is incredibly clean. It's going to take some getting used to, but I'll post some in my Instagram stories. But you could walk all the way from the very top of this, basically all the way down, um, cross over um, to the Luxembourg and uh, walk all the way through there. 
So see, Montparnasse is not that far at all. It's very easy. And then we're gonna, we'll take you down to the top of the garden. We're going a little long, but I don't think you'll mind. But then if you want uh, today in uh, less than an hour at 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, noon Eastern time, I am going to do uh, my Hemingway in pa the Paris years um, chat. I've got lots of uh, photos and uh, you could find that on my Blue Blanc Rouge Facebook page um, to sign up to join me for that. Um, of course, right now with the with the upcoming uh, PBS show by Ken Burns, um, there's a everything. Everything's buzzing again about Hemingway. I didn't even think about that when I scheduled this, but <laughs> it all works out. There was quite a few people. I don't know if uh, yesterday they uh, the police ended up going down to the K along the Seine and. Uh, kicking people out because there were so many people there and it was a sunny day. Um, there were so many people there that they uh, closed it off and kicked them out. And there's some pretty impressive uh, pictures of just this huge line of police kicking them out, um, which is, it's hard. Everybody lives in very small places in Paris and you don't have a backyard or anything like that. So the parks in the K or your backyard. Um, and so unfortunately, They kicked you out. So right down here, we're just at the top of the garden with all of those perfect trees that are so perfectly lined up. Um, the gardeners at the Luxembourg, we'll do a whole walk inside there one day, um, but the gardeners, uh, there's a, just to the right of where we are right now, there's a, um, a bunch of greenhouses and during uh, I was able to go inside of those to go check them out and they they're just they're so they they cultivate and take such great care with everything they do at the Jardin de Luxembourg and they will go and um, sometimes you could go there and one day everything in the garden is pink and the next day you go and everything is orange and yellow um, and they will basically just pull everything up and uh, replant it overnight depending on the time of the year. And so there we are. We're now at the very start. So we'll we'll just have to tease you, and you'll have to come back. We'll do one. Uh, we'll do one at the garden. That's what you could. Uh, I think that's the door you go into when I went into the garden to go see it. It's normally closed off. It's another beautiful day in Paris. Thank you guys all so much for joining us. And Don and Carol for suggesting Montparnasse. Um, next week, I think, um, I think we're going to go over uh, into the Marais again and uh, do uh, show you some of my favorite little uh, vestiges of long ago that have basically uh, are still standing um, and going up towards uh, Bastille. Oh, Carol, Carol and Donald send me a bunch of ideas. Um, it, it's good too, because I have literally, I have a list of like 50 different places to show you. And so sometimes it's a little overwhelming. That's that building that I'm obsessed with. That's another one. Um, up close, it's absolutely stunning. And who wouldn't want to live there? Like you live right there at the very top, have those top like three floors <laughs> and always look out at the Jardin de Luxembourg. Oh, to the best. So thank you everybody for joining us. And thank you, Kate and Lauren on the camera doing an amazing job taking us through. There they are, the lovely Kate and Lauren. Um, and no puppy today? Nope. <laughs> no, we've left him at home to uh, have a little rest. Oh, have yeah. a little rest. Have a little little me time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We need some time out from us. <laughs> time out. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Claudine. That was really cool. Thank you. Thank you. I know Kay was saying that she she learns the history as we go too. <laughs> yeah. So
so much of it. But thank you guys all so much. And I hope you guys could join me um, in less than an hour, about 48 minutes um, on my Hemingway one. You could find that on Blue Blanc Rouge. And uh, hopefully uh, I could love to see as many of you over there and to share with you all of that time um, in Paris. So thank you, ladies. And we'll uh, be back again next week. Bye. Thank you all for your support. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.